Communism has never worked except in this place. Benjamin Netanyahu is a fascistic dictator, and if only a leftist were to lead Israel, things would be so much better, both for Israelis and Palestinians. It's not Zionism that's the problem. It's right-wing Israeli politicians and the Palestinian terrorists which are preventing Israelis and Palestinians to coexist peacefully together. One of the, if not the greatest myth preventing people to arrive at a correct analysis and position regarding the Israeli occupation in Palestine is that there's a progressive Zionism and that the genocide on the Palestinian people is the fault of an impractical, bad policy decision of the right-wing alliance government. So today, we're gonna dive deep into the history of socialist Zionism, which isn't just any Zionist current. It has been the dominating tendency for most of the 20th century, being mainly responsible for the settler colonial expansion and dispossession in the early decades, culminating in the displacement of over 80% of the Palestinian population during the Nakba in 1948. This is part two of my series on Zionism, in part one, we talked about the origins of Zionism, so it's important you watch that one as well. Left-wing and liberal Zionism, which is both just liberal, still play a dominant role in Zionist ideology and politics. They fulfill the critical function of giving the Zionist project the veneer of enlightened Western civilization and progressive politics. How do those who claim to uphold left-wing, socialist values reconcile their support for settler colonialism with Marxism? What is the collectivist kibbutz all about? What the hell is the Israeli left? And what were the real reasons the British Empire decided to help establish the State of Israel? Understanding the history of Palestine means understanding the history of socialist or labor Zionism and how it, under the leadership of the most important Zionist in history, perverted socialism in the name of the superior nation. From 1904 to 1914, during the so-called Second Aliyah, the second wave of Jewish emigration, about 35,000 Jews moved mainly from the Russian Empire to Palestine. Compared to the first Aliyah, this time the settlers were imbued with concepts of a quickly emerging popular ideology. The ideas of Marxism and Socialism exploded in Russia and Eastern Europe due to intensified crises, especially among the Jewish people, who faced intense oppression and a new, more vicious wave of pogroms from 1903. Though these weren't just all immigrants coming to live side by side with the indigenous population, they came with big ambitions and organization. However, those who sought to combine the socialist idea with colonizing a faraway country were only a small minority among all self-proclaimed socialists in the Jewish community. Only 3% of the 2 million Jews who left Eastern Europe between 1882 and 1914 went to Palestine. Most wanted to go to the United States, and many of those who did move to Palestine subsequently emigrated to other countries due to harsh, unfamiliar conditions. In any case, most Jewish socialists saw Marxism not Zionism, as the only solution to the problem they faced in their own countries, without the need to take someone else's land. Already in 1886, Russian Jewish socialist Ilya Rubanovich wrote, What is Palestine? Mr. Lilienblum says that we have a historical right to Palestine. A historical right. And by what means will you defend that historical right? Woe unto you if, under the protection of international bandits and by the manipulation of international intrigue and corrupt diplomacy, you force the peaceful Arabs to defend their rights. They will answer tears with blood and will bury your hereditary claims under the ashes of your homes. The most important Russian Marxist Vladimir Lenin wrote in 1903, the Zionist idea is absolutely false and basically reactionary. Factory owners in the Russian Empire preferred Christian to Jewish workers because the latter were more likely to revolt. Indeed, Jewish people were among the fiercest labor organizers during the strike wave at the time. Out of these, the powerful General Jewish Labor Bund, short the Bund, erupted into the scene in 1897, in the same year as the first Zionist Congress, which was headed by Theodor Herzl, the second most important Zionist in history. After Herzl's death, Chaim Weizmann, the third most important Zionist, would soon become the leader of the Zionist organization, writing in 1903, quote, 
Our hardest struggle everywhere is against the Bund. This movement consumes much energy and heroism. Children are in open revolt against their parents. Many rabbis worried about the Communist Manifesto replacing the Torah. Prominent Bundist leader Vladimir Medem wrote in his memoir, many hundreds of young men left the yeshiva, Jewish religious schools, and plunged into the exhilarating secular world. The Zionists at the time were sweating because of this new explosive movement drawing oppressed Jewish people away from their colonialist project. Particularly because the Bund openly declared their opposition to Zionism regarding it as anti-socialist and reactionary. Medem, who came from a rather wealthy family, would study Yiddish, the language of the Jewish poor, and for much of the Jewish community in Central and Eastern Europe, and strongly opposed Hebrew, the language used by the Zionist project in their nation building. Rejection of Zionism by Jewish socialists is expressed in this popular Yiddish anti-Zionist song. Feuer narische Zionisten mit eier narischen Seichel, ihr mögt doch gehen zu dem Arbeiter und lernen bei ihm ein Seichel. Ihr mögt doch gehen zu dem Arbeiter und lernen bei ihm ein Seichel. Ihr wilt uns führen kein Jerusalem, wir sollen dort Gole dein, wir wollen besser sein in Russenland, wir wollen sehen. As a reaction to the Bundist anti-Zionism, various new organizations were created by people who, just like other reactionaries in Europe, tried to link the, at the time, immensely popular idea of socialism to chauvinist nationalism, both because of opportunism and the need to undermine the revolutionary socialist movement. And it was this labor Zionism, not the right-wing religious Zionism, which would produce the leadership cadre and central structures of the future state of Israel. After the Bund officially rejected Zionism at the turn of the 20th century, a new movement was founded, Poale Zion, workers of Zion. One of its key figures, Ber Borochov, is considered as one of the ideological founders of labor Zionism. The Marxist Zionist ideologues claimed Moses Hess, a German Jewish philosopher in the 19th century as their precursor. Hess had collaborated with Marx, but eventually Marx and Engels ridiculed his politics as he didn't base history on class struggle enough instead seeing the struggle of races and nationalities as the prime factor of history. Quote, Jews are first and foremost a race. They should be the bearers of civilization to the primitive people of Asia and the teachers of the European sciences. But it was Borohov, born in today's Ukraine, who had actual concrete influence on the socialist Zionist movement. He criticized the Rothschild-supported settlements of the first Aliyah since these were often organized on a purely profit-calculating basis, meaning they also hired the cheaper Arab labor, which would undermine the Jewish nationalist project. Quote, Jewish migration must be transformed from immigration into colonization. Although he could imagine Jewish-Arab cooperation, he concluded that in the long run, quote, it is the Jewish immigrants who will undertake the development of the forces of production of Eretz Israel, and the local population of Eretz Israel will soon assimilate economically and culturally to the Jews. As was common among many ideologues of the Second International who applied Marxism in a reformist mechanistic way, he tried to synthesize the concepts of the nation and class in terms of dialectical materialism in his most famous essay, Nationalism and Class Struggle. His No Territory argument stipulated that the supposedly dispersed Jewish workers in the quote-unquote diaspora could not participate in foreign economies due to increasing capitalist competition they needed a productive market of their own. He asserted that competitive capitalism will make the Jews realize that they would need their own territory to establish territorial concentration, and only there could they wage their class struggle. But why Palestine? As a self-proclaimed Marxist, he could not rely on religious justification. So he explained, as did other Zionists, that the indigenous people there 
are not a single nation and cannot rationally oppose Jewish settlement. Quote, they very easily and quickly adapt themselves to every cultural model higher than theirs brought from abroad. They are unable to unite in an organized act of resistance to external influences. They are unsuited for national competition. Palestine would be like a, quote, international hostel. Of course, Borokhov, who never actually set one foot in Palestine, was not the first reviser of Marxism to use the dialectical method as a magic stick to justify nonsense. His predictions predictably failed. The vast majority of Jewish workers did not choose to emigrate to Palestine. Most went to the US, where they would, well, work and co-organize the class struggle. Anti-Palestinian people did formulate coherent national goals and did struggle for their national rights. But even though this quite stupid Marxist Zionism made no sense, it fulfilled an important function. As opposed to the liberal idealist and religious justifications for Zionist colonization, it would give the Jewish cause a seemingly non-idealist, materialist basis around which fake secular pseudo-progressives could rally. Po'alei Tzion, due to its reactionary intent of gluing contradictory principles together, inevitably evolved into an eclectic bunch, which would soon split into different factions. But its massive potential to subvert and exploit the principled Jewish anti-Zionist socialist movement was the common denominator. And it was one young ambitious guy in particular, a fierce anti-Bondist, who would take advantage of this and join the Poale Zion, becoming its most charismatic and successful leader, heading the broader labor Zionist current for several decades, soon becoming the architect of the ethnic cleansing of Palestine and the founder of the State of Israel. David Ben-Gurion, born as David Grün in Poland, made his mark on Zionist politics in Palestine almost straight away. When he witnessed the 1905 revolution in Russia, he thought the Jews would waste their lives in a hopeless cause, that while the revolution may liberate Russia, it will not liberate the Jewish people. Ben-Gurion understood the power of Marxist ideas among young Jewish radicals. When he discovered Poale Zion, he didn't agree with some of its professed principles. Quote, I am not a Marxist. But he saw the movement as an opportunity to draw socialists to the Zionist plan. He had to defeat the Bundists at their own game, so to speak, and Poalition was his chosen instrument. He was impressed by the Bundists' ability to organize defense squads against pogrom attacks in Poland, so he went back home determined to fight them. And, as a proud debate lord, he would challenge them to public debates. One Bund publication wrote that Ben-Gurion began shouting like a maniac during a debate, quote, We have weapons and we will kill you all like dogs. In 1906, Ben-Gurion moves to Palestine. Among the passengers on the ship, he saw Arabs for the first time, writing to his father, quote, They are nearly all good-hearted and are easily befriended. One might say they are like big children. When he arrived in Jaffa, he thought, quote, only of the land of his dreams and its new inhabitants, the Jews. Just like most other Second Aliyah settlers, quote, he had no thoughts to spare for Jaffa and its Arab residents. He did not like the city. Jaffa is not pretty, he writes to his father. He walked from Jaffa to Petah Tikva, one of the first agricultural settlements of the First Aliyah, sponsored by Edmond de Rothschild, now the fifth largest city in the Israeli occupation. There, he found something that shocked him. It was the number of Arabs employed. This is not good, he thought, describing Palestinian workers and farmers as Beit Mihush, an infested hotbed of pain. Quote, I was disgusted to find out that in Hadera, part of the houses were occupied by Arabs, reported another settler. Ben-Gurion thought that if the Jewish farmers would only favor Jewish workers, it would serve the Jewish nationalist cause, which overrides class solidarity. According to him, the Jewish proletariat came from developed capitalist economies, while Arab workers came from a separate, feudal, underdeveloped economy. Just like the liberal he was, he explained that even though the Jewish workers cost more, they would give their employer a higher return, because the Jewish laborer is, quote, 
more intelligent and diligent than the Arab. Ben-Gurion remained an ardent racist throughout his life, but his racism was simply a reflection of the European colonial nature of the Zionist venture. Quote, we have come here as Europeans, we bring with us European civilization, and we would not want to sever our connections and those of the country with the civilization of Europe. We do not see a better representative of Western civilization than England. A month later, he attended the Congress of Pahalei Zion in Palestine, now named Jewish Social Democratic Workers' Party in the land of Israel. There, as the chairman of the sessions, he argued against Jewish-Arab cooperation and argued for Avodah Ivrit, exclusively Jewish labor. In the end, he was elected to the Central Committee and to the chairmanship of the party's platform committee, and immediately began his work to exclude Palestinian workers on lands owned by the Jewish National Fund, implementing the socialist Zionist plan of the Kibush Ha Avodah, the conquest of labor invoking the dictatorship of the Hebrew laborer. In the following year, the party agreed that there should be a segregation of Arab and Jewish economies and produced a Hebrew version of the Communist Manifesto, called the Ramleh Program, which declared the party aspires to political independence of the Jewish people in this country. Ben Gurion's line managed to push through the mention of national struggle alongside the class struggle, and then finally in 1951 he would note, our state is neither capitalist nor socialist, it was simply a Jewish state. Neither capitalist nor socialist, where did we hear this one before? Now you might ask, how come self-described communists or socialists would arrive at such positions? Before we answer that, let's remind ourselves that you'll find these types of socialists denying the self-determination and equal rights of oppressed nationalities all over the world. In Spain against Basques, in Turkey against the Kurdish, in Serbia against Albanians, or in Sri Lanka against the Tamils. One prevalent Israeli myth is that the Jewish settler faced from the beginning terror from Palestinians motivated by anti-Semitism. Israeli historian Ilan Pape points to diaries of early Zionists, which were full of anecdotes about how well Palestinians received foreign Jewish people, offering them shelter and many times teaching them how to cultivate the land. It was only when it became clear that the settlers did not arrive to live alongside Palestinians as neighbors, but to replace them when the resistance took the form of every other anti-colonialist struggle. Borochov's prediction that the Palestinians would not defend their territorial connection quickly fell apart as the indigenous people organized to resist, often violently. Therefore, the Poale Zion leaders created the Hashomer, a Jewish militia to quote-unquote defend the colonizer, who literally invaded with the expressed goal to take over. This myth of defense to legitimize further expansion would persist to this day. Ben-Gurion, experiencing increasing violent resistance among the Palestinians, who felt threatened by expanding settlements, writes for the first time about the severity and dangers of the Arab problem. Among his explanations was that this had to do with the Arab temperament, that violent incidents do not only happen, quote, just between Jews and Arabs, but more commonly among the Arabs themselves, between one tribe and another, or one village with another. His logic was that, just like the Jews in Russia and Poland, if the Jews worked the land in Palestine, it belonged to them. With this, Big Brain Gurion thought he outsmarted the argumentation of the Bundists. The Bundist Moshe Olgin, born into a Jewish family, would mock Ben Gurion, quote, Jewish settlement in Palestine is built upon the ruin of the Arabs. Who are these Arabs? The Jewish settlers fell in battle with the Arabs. But who is this mysterious enemy? Is he a tyrant who has enslaved the country, like the Tsar of Russia? Is he a foreigner who rules the country as the Englishman rules Ireland? Or are these Arabs simply a band of robbers and murderers? No, the Arabs are not at all like that. They are the established inhabitants of Palestine, who lived there for hundreds of years before the arrival of the Zionist settlers. German Social Democrat Karl Kautsky, son of Jewish parents, wrote in 1910, quote, Judaism can advance no claim on Palestine. On the basis of the right of labor and of democratic self-determination, today Palestine does not belong to the Jews of Vienna, London or New York, who claim it for Judaism, but to the Arabs of the same country, the great majority 
of the population. Within the German Social Democratic Party, the largest Marxist party at the time, you already had a right opportunist shift, as we've talked about in the video on the German Revolution, leading the party to abandon revolution and supporting German involvement in World War I. Accordingly, you also had Zionist support under a leftist guise. The Sozialistische Monatshefte, Socialist Monthly Bulletin, was the most important organ of the revisionist right wing, regarding Zionism as a form of socialist colonial policy, celebrating the achievements of the Zionists, such as their appropriation of land in terms of cultural humanity. In June 1914, the Social Democratic member of the Reichstag, Ludwig Kuessel, a staunch advocate of class collaboration in the coming war, drew attention to the opportunities of Jewish settlement in Palestine as a step against the impending impoverishment of cultural humanity. Eduard Bernstein, one of the first important revisers of Marxism, considered the increase of anti-Semitic sentiments to be beneficial for Zionism and concluded that Zionism would also function as an emancipatory movement. So as you can see, today, just like 100 years ago, you still have the same liberal opportunists within the self-proclaimed anti-capitalist left who will criticize the so-called right wing of Israel, but will find excuses for left and liberal Zionism, making them effectively left Zionists themselves. And the Germans are just a particularly stark example of this, but more on that maybe in another video. In 1912, David Grün changed his name to David Ben-Gurion, named after Yosef Ben-Gurion, a first-century Hebrew leader who led the revolt against the Romans. Idealism and myth was crucial to Ben-Gurion's outlook, as was the case with other social fascists. He would later warn the British authorities that, quote, the Bible is our mandate. He did not really believe in the Bible stories used by the religious Zionists as justifications. According to him, what mattered was that many Jews did believe them, whether the stories are true or not. And this is not unique to Zionism. Religious myth was used in justifying colonial conquest in countless other places as well. As Israeli academic Raus Krakotskin said sarcastically, quote, God doesn't exist, but he promised us the land. As the indigenous people of Palestine quickly learned, it didn't matter whether the settlers brought Marx or the Bible with them their fate was sealed. In the last video, we've talked about how many pseudo-leftists talk about Zionism being something decolonial, as Jews returning to their homeland, even though if you go read the most important Zionist leaders, they proudly proclaimed it a colonial movement, which needs to displace its indigenous inhabitants. Ben-Gurion writes, quote, Let us not ignore the truth among ourselves. Politically, we are the aggressors, and they defend themselves. The country is theirs, because they inhabit it, whereas we want to come here and settle down. I wish the left Zionists today were as honest as Ben-Gurion. Having moved to the US during World War I, he held a speech at a Poalitzion convention in Cleveland, speaking, quote, the land of Israel will be built solely by the hands of an industrious people, rich in material and spirit, who will come to it from outside, equipped with modern scientific and technical instruments, and ready at any cost to turn the desert and wasteland into a flourishing oasis, fruitful, culturally rich and populated, like what the English immigrants did in North America and the Dutch immigrants in South Africa and like what the Jews began to do in the land of Israel itself. Meanwhile, the Jewish National Fund created by the Zionist organization was expanding its purchasing operations, buying land from rich landowners who mostly lived outside of Palestine and then evicting the Palestinian tenants. The pseudo-socialist collectivist kibbutzim would then be established on top of these lands from which Palestinians were displaced, matching the conquest of labor through the conquest of land. But more on that in the next part. But there was one big obstacle to the left Zionists. They realized early on that without a big imperial daddy, they cannot bring their pseudo-Marxist settler colonialism to the next level. Until the latter years of the Ottoman period, the Zionists were not allowed to purchase land, though they still found ways to circumvent restrictions. This changed with the decline of Ottoman rule and the arrival of the British, who removed these legal restrictions and became the chief partner in Zionist colonization of Palestine.
One common defense of international support for Zionism, which appears progressive, is that the democratic, human rights respecting governments want to protect Israel as the only safe haven for Jews and the quote unquote only democracy in the Middle East. So we need to take a look at the actual reasons why the imperialists, principally the United Kingdom, helped establish the State of Israel. The Jewish pogroms in Russia had caused a flood of Jewish immigrants to Britain, and the British government under the then Prime Minister Arthur Balfour, also called Bloody Balfour by the Irish, was under pressure to restrict it. Theodor Herzl had already tried to exploit the anti-Semitism prevalent among European rulers. World War I created a significant change for Palestine. Zionists had sided with the Allied powers who defeated the sick Ottoman Empire, which had ruled over Palestinian land. In 1915, the British High Commissioner in Egypt, Sir Henry McMahon, had made a deal with Sharif Hussein of Mecca, now sometimes regarded as the most important international document in the history of the Arab national movement. In return for helping the British to fight the Ottoman Empire, Britain would pledge to recognize and uphold Arab independence in a defined area, which included Palestine. Many Arabs had enough of Ottoman rule. Many Muslims despised the Turkish rulers for claiming to represent Islam. Many of the Arab countries were already dominated by the Western imperial powers and followed their interests, much like today. Britain had invaded Egypt in 1882 to enforce debt repayments and expand British influence. But the British media did not tell the public that they did it because of that. And what did they tell people? That it was because of human rights and women's liberation. Lord Cromer, who oversaw the occupation, wrote, quote, Islam as a social system has been a complete failure. The degradation of women in the East is a canker that begins its destructive work early in childhood and has eaten into the whole system of Islam. The solution, according to him, was that Muslims, quote, be persuaded or forced into imbibing the true spirit of Western civilization. However, back home, this champion of Egyptian women's rights was the biggest campaigner to deny British women the right to vote. Unsurprisingly, Egyptian women's rights even deteriorated in many areas under British colonial rule. We see, of course, the same liberal justifications for degrading both the Palestinian resistance and Palestinian society vis-à-vis -vis these so enlightened European-Israeli values. Today as well, liberals and Eurocentric leftists, who are also liberals, take the left-right spectrum and isolate it from the global imperialist relations between oppressor and oppressed nations, which they often deny or justify, celebrating supposedly progressive domestic policies in high-income countries, while disregarding how those nations benefit from the system of global exploitation, then pointing fingers at conservative, religious sectors of Palestinian society without criticizing the role of colonial history and the system of imperialism which relies on keeping dominated nations impoverished and without proper self-determined economic development. In the 1910s, the new leader of the Zionist organization, the scientist Chaim Weizmann, got the help of British media to launch a pro-Zionist propaganda campaign. He wrote to one influential editor of the Manchester Guardian, quote, We can reasonably say that should Palestine fall within the British sphere of influence and should Britain encourage Jewish settlement there as a British dependency, we could have in 20 to 30 years a million Jews out there, perhaps more, they would develop the country, bring back civilization to it and form a very effective guard for the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal was already owned by the French and British, which also needed to be safeguarded by regional influence and military might. The Zionists would do what they can do best other than stealing and killing. Lying. Weizmann would address British public opinion in a letter to the Times in 1917, saying, quote, The Zionists are not demanding in Palestine monopolies or exclusive privileges. Yet in the previous year, the Zionist organization sent a formal statement to the British government in which it requested exclusive privilege because, quote, the present population requires the introduction of a new and progressive element in the population. Weizmann, who would later become the first president of Israel, was a cunning and effective strategist. But that alone wouldn't have been enough. To his delight, he learned that there was a British cabinet member whose Zionist ambitions were even greater than his. Home Secretary Sir Herbert Samuel, who, through his lobbying efforts within the British ruling class, was one of the most important figures in making Zionism successful. 
to win over the Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Grey. He argued that the geographical situation of Palestine is of great importance to the British Empire. The Prime Minister at the time, H. H. Asquith, was still not convinced, remarking, quote, Curiously enough, the only other partisan of this proposal is Lloyd George, who, I need not say, does not give a damn for the Jews or their past or future, but thinks it will be an outrage to let the holy places pass into the possession under the protectorate of agnostic, atheistic France. Lloyd George had been the Minister of Ammunitions. Weizmann had already persuaded him. George said he respected the Zionist leader, since he contributed greatly to British war efforts, among other things, by discovering a new process in acetone production, a substance needed for the manufacture of explosives. Later saying pointedly, acetone converted me to Zionism. There was another guy who supported Samuel's plans, a certain Sir Mark Sykes, assistant secretary to the war cabinet, who unsuccessfully used Zionism as leverage to appeal to American Jews to pressure the US government into the war. When the Asquith coalition government fell in 1916, the ardent imperialist Lloyd George became the new prime minister. Former Prime Minister Arthur Bloody Balfour, who said to have, quote, always been a Zionist long before the war, became Foreign Secretary. Other important British Zionists got assigned ministerial positions as well. And with these men, British support for Zionism was assured. Unlike the big colonial powers, the Zionists had no power. They had no army and controlled no seas. Without British imperial interests, Israel would not exist today. Sykes immediately began negotiations with the Zionists. To him, the main problem wasn't the Palestinians. He just didn't care about them. It was France, which wanted to control both Syria and Palestine. But after the Bolshevik Revolution brought down Tsarist Russia, an important partner of the French, it changed the power balance and France became more amenable to British demands. So they eventually dropped the internationalization of Palestine idea, a compromise idea between the great powers, who all wanted to control it. It's important to remember that Palestine is of immense value to the imperialists, not only for its geostrategic benefits, but also because of its big historic and symbolic value. British politicians used various public explanations for their support of Zionism, such as the need to get the support of American Jews or to repay Chaim Weizmann for his war efforts. Though returning someone a favor by giving away someone else's territory is, let's say, very British. Or as historian Joseph Jeffries put it, quote, If land was the only possible recompense, there were the Isle of Wight and other British places in Britain's free gift, ready to be handed over. But perhaps the most ardent Zionist Brit was someone else, good old Mr. Winston, who was already known for saying the most racist shit you've ever heard in your life and who explained in Rome that fascism is awesome because it provided, quote, an ultimate means of protection against the cancerous growth of Bolshevism. In 1920, he would explain that Zionism would have a similar effect. Winston Churchill, an anti-Semite himself, attributed the rise of communism to a Jewish conspiracy since, he explained, the movement was composed of a disproportionately high number of Jewish leaders. In 1920, he writes an article titled Zionism versus Bolshevism, a struggle for the soul of the Jewish people. Quote, From the days of Spartacus Weishaupt to those of Karl Marx, and down to Trotsky, Bela Kuhn, Rosa Luxemburg, and Emma Goldman, this worldwide conspiracy for the overthrow of civilization and for the reconstitution of society on the basis of arrested development of envious malevolence and impossible equality has been steadily growing. The future Prime Minister regarded Zionism as a great competing force with profound significance for the whole world, since it would attract the Jews away from communism and weakened that evil Bolshevik conspiracy because Zionism was, quote, in violent contrast to international communism. Later, Churchill would tell the Palestine Royal Commission that he will not apologize for the Jewish colonization of Palestine because, he explains, it's good if a higher race replaces a lower race. Quote, I do not admit, for instance, that a great wrong has been done to the Red Indians of America or the black people of Australia. I do not admit that the wrong has been done to these people by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, a more worldly, wise race, to put it that way, has come in and taken their place. 
The president of the Anglo-Jewish Association, who put up strong pressure against the Zionist plans, emphasized that it was, quote, very significant that anti-Semites are always very sympathetic to Zionism. Indeed, Bloody Balfour's enthusiastic support for Zionism could have also been partly motivated by anti-Semitic considerations, since he was quite firm in restricting quote-unquote alien immigration, meaning largely Jewish, to England. This was not far-fetched, as the American Zionists used exactly this argument to get support from the Wilson administration. The leading American Zionist, Wilson advisor Justice Brandeis, told Balfour that Zionism was the answer to Russian Jewish emigration, to which Balfour agreed. Then, finally, on November 2, 1917, with a single sentence, in a notorious letter to Baron Rothschild, a wealthy and prominent leader in the British Jewish community, Britain officially declared its support for the Zionist plan, the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. Not mentioned in it, the people making up 94% of that country, the Palestinians. The so-called Balfour Declaration is not just a simple document. Palestinian author Rashid Khalidi writes that this is a declaration of war. And that's how the Palestinians received it. This country is our country, wrote Palestinian exiles in a letter to the peace conference in Versailles, expressing their horror at the open claim of their homeland. The declaration was rewritten six times, adapting its language mostly to the massive opposition of non-Zionist Jewish people. Initial drafts straight up declared Palestine a Jewish republic, but then softened the language by deceptively writing a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. Meanwhile, Ben-Gurion, addressing a crowd of 2,000 people at the Great Hall at Cooper Union in Manhattan, celebrating the Balfour Declaration. Later, a big secret was leaked and published by the Bolshevik government after taking power, which would change the history in the Middle East. Sir Mark Sykes had made a secret agreement with French diplomat François-Georges Picot to split and occupy Arab territory, violating the aforementioned mcmahon hussein correspondence, which some consider as the greatest betrayal to the Arab world. British apologists and Zionist writers would later claim that Palestine had not been included in the area promised to be an independent Arab state. However, as usual, they were wrong. As McMahon had not excluded Palestine and did in fact designate Palestine as part of the Arab state. Although political maneuvering of these people were crucial in making Israel happen, it's important to understand that these people wouldn't have played this role in history if it wasn't for the material, systemic forces that led to the convergence of these two interests. Israel has always been, from the beginning, a crucial outpost of imperialism, first of British and today principally of the Yankee variant. Self-proclaimed progressives supporting Zionism are, just like then, in league with imperialists and not humanists caring for the well-being of Jewish people. With British occupation, the pieces were set for the progressive colonizers to escalate the settlement process and to establish the core pillars of the future Israeli state. After the fall of the Ottoman Empire, Britain occupies Palestine and governs it through a military administration until 1920, when it's replaced under a civil administration under the terms of the League of Nations mandate for Palestine. Its leader, a high commissioner, a certain Sir Herbert Samuel, who from the beginning began his work to undermine Palestinian organization and make the Zionist project successful. In 1919, a group of liberal Zionist businessmen established the newspaper Haaretz, which emerged out of a newspaper influenced by socialist Zionists and sponsored by the British military government in Palestine. Occasionally, publishing a piece critical of Zionism, it largely serves to represent the left liberal Zionist viewpoint, leading to hilarious conflicting headlines such as these. Meanwhile, the Poale Zion split in the same year, somewhat mirroring the split in the Second International between communists and social democrats, who now fully embraced reformism and soon capitalism. The right-wing part under Ben-Gurion formed the Achtut Ha Avodah, labor unity, 
which opposed membership in the Communist International, or Third International, in favor of alignment with the Zionist organization and the right wing of the former Second International. Vladimir Lenin called this faction the representatives of the labor aristocracy and the real agents of the bourgeoisie and the working class movement. This faction now encompassed all the European Social Democratic parties who would fully support Israel during the Cold War. They finally regarded it as socialist and thought it must be defended against the Soviet-supported evil Arab hordes. The so-called left Poalition faction, on the other hand, lobbied for membership in the Communist International, which rejected it, but still offered individual left Poalition members to participate. However, they refused, and the Comintern declared their organization an enemy of the workers' movement. The Soviet Union cracked down on them until officially banning their organizations in 1928. The Achtut HaAvodah did not skip a beat and with the allowance of the British immediately replaced the Hashomer militia with a more advanced military organization, the Haganah, meaning the defense in English. Again, painting the colonizer-aggressor as the defending one. It's no coincidence that the Haganah, who would be trained by the British, would later form the core force of Israel's military, the Israeli Defense Forces. The settlers and the British faced increasing resistance by the Palestinians, so it's the natural consequence of colonialism to be realized through force. The Zionist leader and godfather of Netanyahu's more right-wing trend was called Zeyev Jabotinsky, who wrote in 1923, quote, The iron law of every colonizing movement, a law which knows of no exceptions, a law which existed in all times and under all circumstances. If you wish to colonize a land in which people are already living, you must provide a garrison on your behalf, or else give up your colonization. For without an armed force which will render physically impossible any attempts to destroy or prevent this colonization, colonization is impossible, not difficult, not dangerous, but impossible. Zionism is a colonizing adventure, and therefore it stands or falls by the question of armed force. In the same year as the founding of the Haganah in 1920, another most crucial institution was born, which then placed the Haganah under its jurisdiction. Ben Gurion's Achtut Ha'avoda worked together with another reactionary labor organization to create the notorious General Organization of Hebrew Workers otherwise known as the Histadrut. Its goal, a purely Jewish workers' economy in Greater Israel, its first secretary, none other than David Ben-Gurion, who now returned from New York to make history in the land of Palestine. The Histadrut is today Israel's labor federation representing the majority of Israel's trade unionists, with almost a million members, and is still involved in land grabbing and the expansion of settlements. And it's no coincidence that the reformist class collaborator unions all over the world, from Germany's DGB to the AFL-CIO in the US, ally with and support it. From the beginning, it enacted the conquest of labor. Haganah member and important labor Zionist leader David HaKohen would later say, quote, I remember being one of the first of our comrades to go to London after the First World War. There I became a socialist. In Palestine, I had to fight my friends on the issue of Jewish socialism, to defend the fact that I would not accept Arabs in my trade union, the Histadrut, to defend preaching to the housewives that they not buy at Arab stores, to prevent Arab workers from getting jobs there, to pour kerosene on the Arab tomatoes, to attack Jewish housewives in the markets and smash the Arab eggs they had bought to praise to the skies the Jewish National Fund that sent Hankin to Beirut to buy land from absentee landlords and to throw the peasants off the land. It's important to comprehend that Zionist settler colonialism and apartheid, which is its logical consequence, is not just conducted by the state itself. Just like before the establishment of the state, apartheid and occupation are subcontracted to various companies, civil and semi-state organizations such as the Histadrut. It's not just Israel its institutions across Zionist society which are complicit. The state itself is just the logical culmination of the settler colonial project. There is extensive evidence of joint businesses and trade union cooperation between newly Jewish settlers and Palestinians. They could not do otherwise because, well, Palestinians lived and worked everywhere. But this was undermined from the beginning by the Zionist movement and was marginalized. 
Similarly, while there were liberal and left Zionists who did argue for peaceful coexistence and against Jewish exclusivity, in actual reality, these voices were politically irrelevant or simply bent the knee eventually, such as one important kibbutz organization which we'll talk about in the next part. Important labor Zionist and his Stadrut co-founder Berl Katznelson, for instance, argued for binationalism in the 30s, but then acquiesced to a demand for a Jewish state in 1940. When we speak about what Zionism is, we must speak about Zionist reality and not quote the one in a hundred Zionists who said something nice about Arabs and why should settlers determine the vision of another people's country anyway? Hence why Palestinians always rightfully remain skeptical about the colonizers' claims to represent their interests. Left Zionists will grant you the permission to criticize Israel's government, but as soon as you criticize broader Israeli society and Zionism, they accuse you of implicit anti-Semitism, stealing your internationalism card or Israeling it, for not being enough in solidarity with the Israeli working class. What they leave out is that Israel is not your average country. It is a settler colonial occupation, which has colonial violence and racism as its foundation. The broader society being involved is the whole point. In 1929, during the 16th Zionist Congress in Zurich, Switzerland, the World Zionist Organization established the Jewish Agency as its operative branch further centralizing and consolidating the pre-state structures, taking the Haganah and other important structures under its wing. Article 4 of the mandate gave the Jewish agency a quasi-governmental status as a public body, giving it wide-ranging powers and international diplomatic status, so it could represent Zionist interests before the League of Nations, for instance. No such powers were allowed to the Palestinian majority in the entire duration of the mandate, despite repeated demands. Again, without British imperialism, Israel would not exist. With such great importance, who would lead the Jewish agency? That's right, Ben-Gurion would serve as its chairman of the executive committee from 1935 until 1948, when the Jewish agency would become part of the government of the State of Israel, and Ben-Gurion its first Prime Minister. Zionist organization President Chaim Weizmann would later explain to the UN that the Jewish agency can be compared to the East India Company, which colonized parts in India, Southeast Asia and Hong Kong. Quote, All of you will remember the East Indian Charter Company, the Jewish agency, which had the function of a charter company, which had the function of a body which would conduct the colonization, immigration, improvement of the land, and do all the work which a government usually does, without really being a government. One year later in 1930, Ben-Gurion made another important move. His Achtut Ha'avodah joined with another pseudo-socialist organization to create Mapai, its leader, of course again, Ben-Gurion. Mapai is, according to Wikipedia, still a left-wing organization, but not as far left as other factions. Which is, again, Wikipedia saying Wikipedia thinks. The Mapai was to become the dominant force in Israeli politics, responsible for the Nakba, occupation, apartheid, and further displacement until merging into the modern-day Israeli Labour Party in 1968, continuing its left-settler colonial legacy but more on that in one of the next parts. So, to conclude, the hypocrisy of left Zionism is a masterpiece in cognitive dissonance. Socialist Zionism is a dazzling display of ideological acrobatics that rivals the most skilled contortionist. An audacious attempt to marry socialism with the creation of a Jewish homeland on another people's soil. A union so harmonious it makes a cat playing the piano seem utterly plausible. Just like there's no anti-fascist fascism or anti-racist racism, there can be no socialist Zionism. Yet again, we see the importance of guarding against those who revise Marxism to serve the needs of imperialism and fool the working class. Without the commitment to fight national oppression, socialism is an empty word used to justify class society, national chauvinism and the suffocation of the communist movement. Finally. At the 18th Zionist Congress in 1933, the Labour Zionists won the election and now led the Zionist organization, 
officially becoming the dominant Zionist current outside of Palestine as well. Now, almost all the pieces were set for the planned ethnic cleansing of Palestine, commanded by the Jewish agency leadership, with Mr. Neither Capitalism nor Socialism Ben-Gurion at its helm. But there was still one big piece missing. Most of the settlers preferred to settle in the cities. No one was bent on going to the countryside. This was a problem because in order to eventually show that there are Jewish people living and owning land everywhere, the settlers had to spread all over Palestinian land. It is within this context that agricultural collectives with a utopian socialist vision were motivated. A core pillar of the socialist Zionist current, crucial in the displacement of Palestinians from their homes and in building the pseudo-progressive myth of egalitarian collectivism. I'll see you soon in the next part, where we tackle the great lie that conceals bloody colonial conquest and racism beneath the guise of progressivism. The collectives instrumental in the lead up to the Nakba, also known as the Kibbutzim. <laughs>